Reflections Sin's Thoughts, Part 2 Excerpts from Knowing Sin by Mark Jones People can imagine a whole host of evil thoughts which they do not enjoy in the actual outward acting of the sin. In many instances they do not plan to carry out the act, often for a lack of ability to do so, but they allow their imagination to run wild with lusts of all sorts. Theologians in the past have called this speculative wickedness, Many people take a lot of pleasure in their fantasies without the fear of shame that comes for those who actually commit such acts. The spirit may meet such sinful imaginations with a true horror over what has entered the mind, or a continued ruminating delight may occur for what is clearly against God's law. Now it is ordinarily impossible to have an inclination to something without some pleasure, even if it is a small degree. True detestation and hatred of sin, which God and Christ possess, means there is no inclination and thus delight whatsoever. Even when we hate sin, we still hate sin imperfectly. Our inclinations toward sin may begin in seed, so that the smallest hint of sin is about to flower, and we may by God's grace abort its earliest beginnings of the thought. But when we take pleasure in the sinful inclination, it brings a greater guilt upon us. Goodwin put the matter gravely. An outward act of sin, it is but as an act of whoredom with the creature when really enjoyed. But this is incest, when we defile our souls and spirits with these imaginations and likenesses, which are begotten in our own fancies, being the children of our own hearts. Imagining sin is dangerous because it prepares us for the external acts. As Charnock said, how many sinful thoughts are twisted together to produce one deliberate sinful word. The speculative wickedness that remains within even the children of God because of indwelling sin also manifests itself regarding the remembrance of past sins. Goodwin thus spoke of reviving in our thoughts the pleasure of sinful actions past, when the mind runs over past sins with a new and fresh delight, when men raise up their dead actions long since buried in the same likeness they were transacted in. What we should do, added Goodwin, is blot them out through faith in Christ's blood, but instead we copy and write them over again in our thoughts with the same contentment. We are sinfully reliving now internally what we sinfully committed externally in the past. Though no one will see it, God knows it to be sin, and so must we. For Christians who genuinely struggle with the remembrance of past sins, we are obliged before God to keep sin from making us obey its passions. Romans 6.12 Since sin does not have dominion over us, we can have victories over our sins instead of letting them gain the upper hand constantly against us. Our thoughts also need to be governed appropriately. We can even think certain thoughts that are not, in the abstract, sinful, but when we think of them unseasonably, is often forbidden or warned against in the scriptures, for example Job's friends. Just as a word spoken in season is commended, Proverbs 15, 23, 25, 11. Vain thoughts denote those occurring in an inappropriate context. This misplacing of thoughts, suppose they be good, argues Goodwin, is yet from a vanity of the mind. Did those thoughts come at another time, they should be welcome. We find our minds ready to spend thoughts about anything rather than what God at present calls unto. We may be in the middle of praying and suddenly find ourselves thinking about getting to the post office before it closes, or when the hockey game starts tonight. We may be listening intently to the pastor preaching on the glories of Christ's love from John 17, only to find ourselves reflecting on finishing the taxes this week, or what's for lunch. These are misplaced thoughts, which may not be sin in another context, but become such when we should be focusing on something else. To be clear, the sin is aggravated when we know we should be focusing on the sermon, but willingly continue to let ourselves think of other thoughts that distract us from God's word. Misplaced thoughts can plague any Christian, but they are the consistent pattern of the religious hypocrite. Charnock warned, a hypocrite's religious services are materially good, but poisoned by the imagination skulking in the heart that gave birth unto them. It is the wicked mind or thought makes the sacrifice, a commanded duty, much more an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 21, 27. Our thoughts may also bring guilt upon us through fantasizing, Men create fools' paradises to themselves, says Goodwin, and then walk up and down in them, as if they had money enough, what pleasures they would have if they were in such places of preferment. 
Absalom vainly imagined himself as a good king who would take care of people and give them justice. In actual fact, he had no legitimate right to the throne and had no intention of bringing justice to Samuel 15, 4. We can dress our thoughts up in pretended righteousness so long as we can imagine a future of personal status and glory. If I were wealthy, I would give lots of money to the needy, says the heart that deceives itself into thinking we would really do it. In fact, we may be just covering lots of money and wanting to make it look good. We should be aware of the seriousness of vain thoughts. Charnock argues that sinful thinking brings us into the nearest communion with the devil. For example, jealousy and selfish ambition plunged us into the earthly, unspiritual, demonic wisdom from below, James 3.15. There is a battle for our thoughts and affections. Satan would love to dethrone Christ from our hearts. He attacks relentlessly and we sadly give in far too easily. Judas's betrayal of Christ began in the imagination, but, as John tells us, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, John 13, 2. The plots of Judas to orchestrate the arrest of Jesus were those of a man in deep communion with Satan. As Christians, we do not need to despair that Satan can have dominion in our minds, but that does not mean he cannot influence our minds with his various onslaughts. What hope do we have against such an enemy? When the evil thoughts rise up, and they will, we can find immediate cleaning in Christ, and the grace to fight off the mental attacks, for he was the one who did so perfectly. Still, we must remember that it is never fine to delight in evil, even if we never carry it out. Such delight remains a dance with the devil in the presence of Christ, who dwells in our hearts by faith, Ephesians 3.17. Many of our thoughts are downright wicked, and we would be utterly ashamed if a video of such showed up on YouTube. This should humble us to the core of our being, especially when we are tempted to lift ourselves up in comparison with others. In fact, we are filled with vain thoughts about ourselves as Goodwin observed in the occasions when we are proud, self-confident, self-applauding, foolish, covetous, anxious, unclean. Paul noted this of the self-righteous Jews in his time who refused to submit to God's righteousness, Romans 10:3 and were culpable of vain thoughts about themselves. But even the most irreligious of this world foolishly fantasize about promoting themselves, ignorant of God's will for their lives. As Charnock noted of such, the most forlorn beggar has sometimes thoughts vast enough to grasp an empire. Even though sin has no dominion over the Christian, and God gives us good thoughts of him and his grace, we still struggle with stirring up all sorts of evil in our minds, this is vanity, a striving after Satan. Still, let us be encouraged as Christians that Christ exhibited the perfect thought life for us as the foundation of our justification and the source and example of our sanctification. Let us likewise rejoice that God has more thoughts toward us of mercy, love, and goodness than we have of rebellion toward Him. We can say with the psalmist, How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. Psalm 139, 17-18 We are also commanded to bring every thought captive to obey Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And God does not command what he does not give. He gives us the grace to bring our thoughts into subjection to him, so that we can obey Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. The Lord also gives a clarion call to repentance, which we all need to hear, just as his people of old needed. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Isaiah 55, 7. God abundantly pardons. When we consider how many thoughts have risen up and gone astray during the days of our existence, we should be thankful for the abundant mercies that are shown to us through Christ Jesus. Do not be like the wicked, who have no room in their thoughts for God, Psalm 10, 4, but rather think of God often so that good replaces evil, 